and respect the right of the speaker to share their perspective and ideas by not causing a disruption to the event's activities. At the conclusion of the event, there will be a question and answer session during which you may ask questions and engage in dialogue. Please be sure to phrase your comments in the form of a question. In the interest of time, we ask that each person be concise and ask only one question. And without further ado, I want to hand it over to the fabulous Elena Suspedas, who is a uh, sophomore in the college, and she'll be getting us started. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, as Hannah said, my name is Elena Suspedas. I am a sophomore in the college, majoring in government. Um, I first got involved in GU politics last semester as part of Brianna Keeler's student strategy team. Um, working with Brianna, who is a, a CNN uh, senior political correspondent, was an amazing experience. I believe the best at Georgetown I have, I've had thus far. Being from Puerto Rico, I got involved with GU politics because I wanted an insight on the US political system. I strongly <coughs> believe it is not enough to sit in, li in the library and read a book about it. Through geopolitics, I get the holistic education that Georgetown is all about. With events like the one tonight, it is impossible not to acquire knowledge to put into play into all our futures. Tonight, as part of the Reflections on Running series, we are having conversations with Senator Rick Santorum, moderated by Mo Lisi. Mo Lisi, a fellow Hoya, is the executive director of geopolitics. Before launching the Institute, Mo spent nearly two decades as one of the top communication strategists in the Democratic Party. Most, re most recently, the Communications Director of the Democratic National Committee. He is a veteran of four presidential campaigns, including a senior spokesman on Hillary Clinton's 20, 2008 campaign. Let's give a warm welcome to Mo. <laughs> Joining Mo, we have the honor of having tonight Rick Santorum. Senator Santorum, born in Winchester, Virginia, is the father of seven children. He was the co-founder of Patriot Voices, a grassroots and online community to mobilize for conservative causes and candidates. He served in the U.S. House of Representatives from 1991 to 1995 for Pennsylvania's 18th Congressional District and in the U.S. Senate from 1995 to, 19, to 2007. Sorry. He's also a New York Times bestselling author for Bella's Gift, How One Little Girl Transformed Our Family and Inspired a Nation, a book about his daughter with special needs. Senator Santorum was a candidate for the Republican for the Republican nomination for President of the United States in 2012 and 2016. In 2012, his victory in Iowa catapulted him to frontrunner status, where he won 11 states and nearly 4 million votes during the Republican primary process. Announcing his bid in 2015, he was also a contender for the nomination in the 2016 election. <coughs> Join me in welcoming Rick Santorum to Georgetown. to have you here. Before beginning, we encourage you all to tweet, Instagram, and Snapchat photos of this event using the hashtag <laughs> Centorum at Georgetown, at DU, sorry. Thank you so very much for coming, and without further ado, Mo and Senator Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. This is a great turnout tonight. Um, as Elena said, Senator, I spent you know, two decades in the trenches as a Democratic operative. If you had told me when I was DNC comms director that I'd be sitting here with you having a conversation like this, I would have uh, scratched my head in bewilderment. And that's the cool thing about this, that we're able to sit down now and have a real conversation and pull back the curtain a little bit and talk a little bit. And that's what I want to do tonight, is not so much do the same kind of deconstruction of the campaign or whatever it is um, others might ask. I, I, I think tonight we're kind of interested in you showing us the journey, right? What it's like to do this, because it's a pretty big thing, um, and the motivations. And so to get us started, I actually want to go back a little bit before your other your presidential campaigns to 1990. Um, you were a young lawyer, recently married, in your early 30s, and you decided to run for Congress against a seven-term incumbent, Democratic incumbent, in a pretty heavily, overwhelmingly Democratic district. Uh, why? What motivated you and inspired you to run for office and to do it against pretty long odds? Yeah, I, uh, I just thought, first, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, I decided to run uh, because I, I worked in government. I was a lawyer, but I'd worked for a state senator while going to law school. And, and 
And so I had some experience with politicians and and I had friends on both sides of the aisle, believe it or not, I know people find that hard to believe, but I did, I had friends on both sides of the aisle. And one of the things I always valued, just in the five years I spent in Harrisburg in the state Senate as a staff person, was uh, I, I liked people who were authentic. And if you, you know, if you believe that stuff, God bless you. Go out there and you know, do what you think is right for the country. What I really couldn't stand, the, the guys that I turned, I, I found out I just, they weren't good people, and I just didn't like, they didn't belong in government for folks who would say whatever they needed to say in front of one group and say something else in front of another group and be sort of this chameleon type of figure. That to me was this not honorable, it wasn't honest, and it's not what politics and government should be about. And so that really always, that, that was, that, that was my pet peeve. Well, I went, went back, practiced law, and you know, I was an person in my community, so I'd show up to town hall meetings to my elected officials. I mean, who does that? I do. And, and so I'd see this guy and this congressman, he'd get up and he was, you know, he's one of the most liberal members of Congress, come back and talk like he was, you know, Jesse Helms back into this district and in, in front of, and, and who is this guy? And the more I looked into it, he just, I said, this guy needs someone to run against. Him. And so uh, he had had, never gotten less than 60% of the vote, had, uh, was a subcommittee chairman, pretty powerful guy, heavily Democratic district, and no one else wanted to run. So I just decided uh, I'm going to take a shot, and 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 just went out and started working hard. I knocked on twenty thousand doors, uh, and uh, no one paid any attention to me. Uh, and in fact, when uh, just to give you an idea, when we won uh, on election night, uh, I'll, I'll never forget this. I read this blurb two days later in the Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street Journal uh, said on election night we called. Uh, we got a notice that this guy's name was Doug Walgren. Doug Walgren lost. The AP sent a wire out saying this congressman lost, but they didn't list who won. They just list who won. <laughs> That's all. Because I didn't. I mean, I got no support from anybody. I got no PAC money, no support from the RNC, no support from the congressional committee, nothing. Uh, and so we called the head of the Republican National Congressional Committee to uh, to get the name, and they didn't have. Money. That's how much of a long shot I was. And, uh, and so I, I just decided uh, that you had to go out, you, you go out and you, uh, you stand for what you believe in, you work hard, we organize. Uh, I did, like I said, knocked on 20,000 doors, did tons of, of parties, and was making great, I'll tell you one little side story. I was, I was out there running, again, no one gave me a shot. And, working hard, and my state representative's seat came open that the guy decided in January of the election year not to run. And it was that little area where I lived was sort of a marginal, little lean Republican district. And so I was out there working hard running for Congress, and so the, uh, so the House folks, the State House folks, called me and said, hey, would you be interested in running for this seat? We hear you're doing a good job, and you, know, you can't win that one, but you, you might actually be able to win this one. And I said, no, I said, you know, if you'd asked me that six months ago, maybe, but you know, I'm sort of down the path on this. I made a lot of commitments. They said, no, you really should think about it. You can't win that one, but you can really, you can win this one and we'll help you. We'll get all behind you. We'll hold on to this seat. And I said, no, I, I don't want to do that. And um, so a little, like a couple days later, I get a call from the, uh, the Republican leader of the, of the state house, who's from Philadelphia. And he called and said, hey, you know, my uh, staff guy called you and, you know, he wants you to run. And I said, yeah, I, I, you know, I told him I, I wasn't interested. He said, no, you don't understand. We, we need you to run. And I said, yeah, no, I get it. I, I appreciate you want me to run. He said, well, let me, he said, how about if we have dinner? I said, sure. I mean, I'm happy to have dinner with you, but I, you know, I'm telling you, I've already, been, great, we'll have dinner. So it's, it's, like, it's like this biblical reference uh, I, I can come up with. He takes me to the top of the triangle. Now, if you're in Pittsburgh, anybody from Pittsburgh, any Pittsburghers here? Okay, we've got a Pittsburgh. Top of the triangle, it's the 63rd floor of the largest building. It's the U.S. Steel Building in Pittsburgh. And there's a, there was a restaurant up there. And he takes me up to this restaurant, window seat, and he basically stands there and he says, this can be yours. Right? <laughs> <laughs> all right? So I feel like, all right, I think I know who this guy is. And he says, that's what he did. He puts, right, puts all the maps out on the table and talks how I'm going to win this and how I can't win the I mean, hour-long dissertation. And, and so I 
finished and I said, you know what, this is really great. I said, but now I'm, I'm gonna run for Congress. And I'll never forget this, the guy leans over, takes all the maps, shoves them off the table like this, and leans over to me and says, look, redistricting is in two years, and we're gonna lose two seats. If you win, you lose. If you run, and even if you win, here's my promise to you, I will eliminate your seat. So you either run for the state house, or I'll kill you. That's what he said to me. And I said, thank you very much, shook his hand, got up and walked out. And I won. And two years later, they eliminated my seat. <laughs> <laughs> and 10 years later, he went to jail. <laughs> All true. That's amazing. Um, OK, so let's, let's keep going. So they eliminate your seat. Yeah. You have to run in a new district. Seven, it's even heavier Democrats. Yeah. Uh, it was, the first one was 60%, second was 70% Democrat administration. And, uh, but something happened, and this was the greatest blessing that I had as a, uh, as a new member of Congress, is that I knew I was only gonna be there for two years. I knew they were gonna get rid of my seat. And, um, and so I went there having not received any money from anybody yeah. other than grassroots people, and that's who won my race. And so I went there and just, I figured I'm gonna do the right thing. And, and just spend my two years, and then go to, probably go end up doing something else. I'll probably, you know, depending on what the seat is, you know, unless they stick me in the city of Pittsburgh, which they could have done, and they didn't. Um, they, and I said, you know, I'm just gonna run. So several things happen. Um, it is a incredibly freeing experience. Just go there and, and just be an honest broker. And I don't know if you're familiar with the, this, this is a long time ago, I mean, before probably any of you were born. Uh, there was a group called the Gang of Seven, which uh, was led by me and a guy named John Boehner. Uh, there were seven of us, seven freshman Republicans, who uh, saw, I, both John and I saw this report that was issued by the General County Office that talked about how members of Congress, when you, back then, when you got paid, you didn't get paid and your money went to your bank account. Your money went to an account at a house bank. And I remember going uh, and signing up and uh, they said, you have to sign up for the bank. I said, well, why can't you just send the check to my bank? I said, no, 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 your, your check has to go to the house bank. And then if you want to write a check from that, you can do that. I didn't, you know, I, I was just, I didn't know I wasn't, I wasn't supposed to be there. I'm not gonna certainly, <laughs> I'm not gonna protest that. I said, okay, fine, I'll have that down at house bank. So I didn't know anything about it. And, and so this report, GEO report comes out and talks about how all these members of Congress have these accounts at the House Bank that they, they don't have any money in them. And that they just write checks that they have no money for. And they just basically have interest-free loans and the bank just covers all the checks that they want to write on anything they want to write checks on. And I said, well, that doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound like you know, that you're using taxpayer dollars. Obviously, someone's paying for this, these interest-free loans that they're getting. And so uh, we went out and started asking questions, and they said, oh, yeah, that report comes out every two years. And you know, it's usually some freshman member will read it and go to the floor and make a speech about it, and that'll be it. And I said, wait, so you know this has been going on for a long time? Yeah, 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 but you know, it's not a big deal. I mean, it's not, an, it's not a lot of money, you know, and, and it's just, you know, it's a, it's a convenience. And so we said, okay, so we decided we weren't gonna let this go. And long story short, we, every day, a group of us, seven of us, went to the House floor every day and made speeches about this and, and then started to investigate other things and found out that uh, there was some funny business going on at the, at the post office where members of Congress, in fact, then actually got stamps from the post, rolls of stamps you would buy from the post office. And um, turns out a couple of them actually took those rolls of stamps and sold them for cash. <laughs> Uh, and um, so we investigated all this stuff and took an enormous amount of heat. But in so doing, uh, I get a, I, you know, I'm now running for re-election in this 70% blue collar. It's the old Steel Valley of Pittsburgh. I mean, used to have 300,000 steel workers. Now maybe had a third of that, not even a third of that back then. And they loved the fact that you had some guy there just shaking it up. And so in a 70% uh, Democrat, George Bush, when he was running for re-election, got 29% in my district back in 1992, and I got 61. And so uh, it just shows you that good, good policy and, and, and honest, forthright politics is 
good no matter what your party is. Yeah, and, and so this is a good segue because two years later, you, you, you know, after they eliminated your seat, two years later, you run for the Senate right. and you knock off a Democratic incumbent as part of, you know, the, there was sort of a wave, yeah, that was, right? That was, yeah, I, I beat an incumbent in my first race. Yeah. I got put in when I got redistricted in with a 28 year Democratic incumbent in my second race. Mm -hmm. And then I beat a Democratic incumbent in my third race. Right. And then in your, for your Senate reelect in 2000, I was looking at the numbers today and it really struck me. You got, Al Gore won the state. You won re-election. You and Al Gore got almost the exact same number of votes. There were a lot of Gore-Santorum voters, which, you know, if you talk to a lot of people in my, like, there are a lot of people that would that can understand that, Process right? Now. That Gore-Santorum voters. And so I guess, sort of my question is, you look at how you won all those races, those first, you know, four races, and the type of bipartisan coalition you were able to build as an incredibly conservative Republican in a blue district or a blue state. And so you touched on a little bit about that, that but why, right? How were you, as a conservative, able to appeal to these Democratic voters and build this bipartisan coalition? I think first off, the, the reputation of being just a straight shooter, uh, I, I did. I, I was very accessible. I mean, I did every county every year. I would travel around the state and do meetings like this all the time. I was just always in my state. Uh, never, I really didn't travel anywhere else in the country or in the world. I went home and I spent time with, with voters and I worked on problems. I remember uh, when I got elected to the, uh, uh, to the U.S. Senate in 95, uh, one of the first calls I made was to the mayor of Philadelphia, a guy by the name of Ed Rendell, mm -hmm. and, uh, who worked very hard against me. 1994 and did a heck of a job. I got crushed in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, and I called him. I said, uh, you know, I just wanted to call and just uh, let you know, here's my number, here's my cell. Uh, if you want to get a hold of me, I said, my job is to make you the best mayor in the, in the country. And I, and I, I hope that you know you, you take up, uh, take that seriously, because I do. I said, because you're, you have an important job in my state and I want to help you make sure that you do a good job. And I said, that doesn't mean I'm going to vote the way you want me to vote, but uh, we can help and we can work together on things. And I, I did that uh, all across the state. And I, I just felt like your job is there to serve and to try to make things work better for people. And I probably, I guarantee you, I probably spent more time in the city of Philadelphia in one year than my successor, who's a Democrat, spent in six. I guarantee you that's true. Uh, I mean, I, I was there, all the people say, why are you here so much? You're never gonna get any votes here. I said, yeah, but this is, the, this is, this is where the problems are. And, and this is where the economic engine is for, uh, this is where the, the center of the, of, you know, 45% of the population of my state is. And, if, it's, and if, this, if the core is dying, then the rest of the area is not gonna do well. And you see that in Detroit and some of the other areas. And, and so I, I felt like uh, and we had an obligation to go in and work. And, and I found, sadly, that it's bad politics to do that. Uh, I didn't spend as much time as I probably should have in some of the more areas that would have been friendlier to me electorally, uh, but I, I felt that, you know, I, I, always, I always went into office figuring I was only gonna be there that term. Because yeah. look, I, I mean, I represent heavily Democratic, I mean, there was a million more Democrats and Republicans in the state of Pennsylvania. It was only a matter of time I was gonna lose, no matter how good I was. I mean, it's just, it's just the nature of the state. And so I just never worried about winning and losing. I mean, I, I always wanted to win, I worked hard to win, but I always thought if you do well, uh, you know, people have told me the biggest mistake I made in my political career <coughs> was actually running for the leadership in the United States Senate. My first six years I was uh, in, in, in the Senate, I was an outsider, uh, conservative, tough, but, uh, I was very much a voice for Pennsylvania. When I got elected to leadership, I became a voice for the Republican leadership. And I think that, that hurt me. At the same time, I got a tremendous amount of really important things done when I was in that position. So to me, it was a good trade-off. So 2006, the run ends, right? 
that, that million more votes catches up to you and you lose your Bad year. election. Bad year, Bad right? Year. You got you kind of came in on a wave, not that no, discount you're... the campaign no. that you're at, right? But you came in on a wave wow. and you swept out on a wave, mm -hmm. right? The 2006 was a good year for my, was, for my team. Um, talk about that night and how you process that and how do you rebound. You had a very successful career in politics. Yeah, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I sort of, we, I sort of knew I was going to lose. Yeah. Um, I probably knew I was going to lose for the last two or three months. But you know, you, you run it through the finish line, and we did, and we worked hard. And um, remember, we had uh, we had mass as the, the polls closed eight o'clock in Pennsylvania, so we we had a mass up in our uh, up in our suite uh, at eight o'clock. <laughs> I'll never forget. We finished mass, and just you know, we just said the final blessing, and uh, I get a call on my cell phone. And it's Sean Hannity. And, and I pick up the phone, I said, Sean. He said, I'm so sorry. I said, about what? He said, they just declared you the loser. He said, you didn't see that? I said, no, I've been at mass, I didn't know. And he said, wow, I'm, I just wanted to call you and tell you I, you know, I felt bad, because we obviously developed friendship over the years. So that's how I found out, and I, you know, I told Karen and the kids, they were like, what? I said, yeah. I said, you know, I didn't think it was gonna be a long night. And, uh, and so, I said, let's let's go down there and let's go around, and thank everybody, and get there and thank all the folks who were there, and you know, we'll see what God has in store for us. Um, you know, I, I didn't. I can honestly say I didn't. Uh, I didn't feel bad at all. I felt like I'd done what I was supposed to do. I I ran as hard a race as I could. I ran the race I wanted to run, and um, I served at the time in a way that I wanted to serve. I, I thought I was uh, honest with the people of Pennsylvania about what I was going to do and why I was going to do it. And they didn't want that anymore. I'm okay with that. And so I'll go do something else. And that's what I did. I'm going to fast forward a little bit in the interest of time. Um, five years later, you announce you're going to run for president of the United States. Yeah, it's the next logical right? thing. Sort of non traditional. <laughs> <laughs> you got no perch. Um, and that's Ron Christie, who's on our advisory board. Hello, Ron. Hello, Ron. Um, Great good to see you. Good to see you, buddy. Um, right, you got no no political perch, and the last campaign you ran, you lost. And no, so I didn't you're just lose. For president. I didn't, I didn't just lose. I lost by the largest margin of any incumbent senator in 30 years. Well, I, I didn't want to say it. But. <laughs> so, of course, you run for president. So, of course, you run for president. That's what, about, that's what everybody thought. Talk about that. Talk about that thought. What motivated you to, to jump onto a much bigger stage than one you'd ever been on? Well, look, you don't, at least I don't uh, do anything. Um, you know, I pray a lot. I, I try to listen to what uh, what God has in store for me and try to, uh, you know, I don't hear voices, but you, you get a sense of what you feel you're being called to do. And I always say that, um, that God speaks in whispers and that you don't really hear what's what he has in mind for you unless you're close and you and you're listening and so particularly during those times I try to get uh, very much in in close with him and try to really get an understanding of okay are there things that this you know give me the impression this is what I should do and uh, that came later the earlier part was really just odd um, I have, uh, after we, uh, we lost, we were blessed with a little girl who was born. Uh, her name was Isabella. She has a, uh, she, had, she was born, we were told she was gonna live just a few days. Um, she didn't, she, she survived. Uh, they sent, her, sent us home on hospice care. And uh, we were told it was just in horrible ways that she was gonna die. And uh, so we, uh, we decided after a few weeks that we, we're not gonna just wait around for her to die. And we got rid of hospice, and we decided we were gonna make every day the best possible day and, and fight for her life just like we would any one of our other kids. And, uh, and she's, uh, she'll be eight years old in, uh, in May, and she's a miracle, a miracle every day. Uh, we feel very blessed, but during that time, it was tough. I mean, we went through a lot of challenges health-wise. She was only three and a half pounds when she was born, and she had, all sorts of uh, lung issues and other other issues and feeding issues and every I mean every issue you can imagine so we were dealing with a lot and and 
we, you get into the world, if any of you have a, a sibling um, uh, with a disability or maybe a good friend with a severe disability, you get to know, you, you just sort of get enveloped in that world. And that becomes a big part of who you are. And you also get to know people in your, in your world. Everybody, you know, particularly that world, because there's so few kids who survive more than a few months. Uh, you get to know some of the families who have survivors, and you, you get to hear their stories and hear, hear what's going on, not just in this country, but even around the world. And so that's where I was. That's the state of, of play I was. Bella was born in, in 2008, and, um, and so it was you know, 2009, 2010. I was, got very, very engaged in that world, and then Obamacare comes along. And if anything that, that, that uh, spiked me about Obamacare is not just the policy which I was against, but also what I was hearing from some of these countries that had uh, more government-run type medicine and how children with, like in Canada and, and the UK and other places, how children with this type of disorder are treated there and it isn't good at all. Uh, and so I felt like this was not just about public policy, this was about my daughter and her life and the quality of life of other like my daughter. And so I felt like I had to get out and start doing something. So I decided to sort of step forward on the national stage again. Again, no credentials to do so, just started to fight to do so. Started to do more TV and more radio, part-time radio gig, just something so I could get my voice out. And um, then something very odd happened. Uh, I was at a, uh, a CPAC event a guy walks up to me and says, uh, would you like to come and speak in, uh, in Iowa, where it's a speaker series, would you like to come and speak in Iowa? And at the time, I happened to be walking through CPAC with Mark Levin, who was with me. And he said, do it! And, uh, and I, I said, I said, what do I want to go to Iowa? And I said, no, 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 you, you got to do it, do it! And, and so I said, okay, I said, when do you, well, October, and I said, you know, okay, I mean, maybe, maybe by then, you know, it was, you know, CPAC's like February. Right? And, and so, long story short, I commit to doing this thing. And as I said, I was trying to get myself out there. So we, uh, Matt's my communication guy, he's sitting in the back. So we, we issue a release saying that, that I'm going to Iowa to give this speech in, in, uh, in Dubuque, right? It was in Dubuque. And so we get this call from, was it Politico or The Hill or one of, one of those, Politico. And a guy calls me and says, so you're running for president. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, you're going to Iowa. I said, well, yeah, I was asked by this group to come and speak and give a speech in Iowa. He said, so you're running for president. I said, I said, what? I said, I'm just going to give a speech. Oh, so you're not running for president. I said, well, I'm not, not, and not am. I just, I'm just going to give this speech because someone asked me to give a speech. And he said, oh, so you are running for president. <laughs> and I said, what, what's your problem? He said, he said, nobody goes to Iowa unless they're running for president. <laughs> And so I said, well, I'm not not, and I not am. I'm just going to give this speech. So that was the interview I did. Later that evening, I'm sitting with my mother-in-law and my family in my mother-in-law's apartment in Pittsburgh. And next thing, and we're just talking. Next thing I, and watching Fox News is on, of course. And uh, <laughs> next thing I hear is my, my mother-in-law scream, screech. And I said, what's, and she goes, Rick, you're running for president. <laughs> it's right there in the crawl on Hannon. <laughs> And so Polit Politico runs this front page story, Rick Santorum got Iowa, consider him running for president. So I show up to Iowa. Now, I can remind you, I mean, I'm doing all these events and you know, nobody's paying attention to me. And I show up in Iowa and there's a packed house of 300 people in the rain, in the cold weather, 300 people, C-SPAN cameras, playing it live, all these national reporters there and I'm thinking, this is a good gig. <laughs> you want to get your voice out, this is great. So a couple weeks later, we, we announced we're going to New Hampshire. Same thing, all these people show up and they want to hear what I have to say. And so we just thought, well, this is a great thing. So we just started to do it. And next thing you know, um, I decided to run for president. And I always say it's absolutely true. Uh, no one, encourage me to do this. No one, not a single person. I always say, I always make that one person encourage me to do it. And that was my 14 year old daughter, Sarah Maria. She actually was all into it. She had, she went to all the research and all the states and all this stuff and everything. And she presented to me. And, and so she was the only person, the only person who encouraged me to run for president. 
And three months after I announced, she recanted. <laughs> so that's that, kid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so that'll tell you it was a very lonely journey. I mean, it, yeah. it, because it made no sense. But look what happened, right? You come out of nowhere. You win Iowa. Not really. <laughs> because on caucus night, I lost. Okay. And, and people always right. say, oh, Rick, you won right. the Iowa caucuses, but really I didn't. Right. Because when does it matter when you win? That's right. That's right. It doesn't matter that two and a half weeks later you got declared the winner. Mm -hmm. It matters on caucus night whether you were declared the right. winner. Because the only thing that matters if you win a, if you win a state is the next the state. Momentum the out. momentum coming out. And the momentum was Romney's, not mine. And what shocked me, because two weeks, two days, excuse me, there was a, there was a, I looked at two days before, I saw one of these real clear politics, two days before the Iowa caucuses, I was at 2% in the national poll, two days before the Iowa caucuses, and uh, ended up winning the caucuses. But that night, I lost by eight votes. And um, instead of the state chairman going out and saying, look, it's eight votes, you know, we're going to have to... Have to wait to we certify this. He went out and said Mitt Romney won. Now, surprisingly, he was a Mitt Romney supporter, right? Mm -hmm. And so he went out and said Mitt Romney won. And the press said, "Wait a minute, it's only eight votes." Yeah, he won. He's going to win this. That's that's how confident I am. And so they played it. They went out and said Romney won. And I thought, no big deal. Come on, I was at two percent. I came out of nowhere. I'm 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 the great story. Everyone's going to write about. Nobody wrote. I was stunned, because I thought I would be the story the next day, not Romney, and I wasn't. Romney was the story. Within eight hours, I wasn't even mentioned by the national media. And there's two, two stories that come out of that. Number one, he was the establishment candidate. He's who Fox News wanted. He's who the establishment wanted. He's who the RNC wanted. That's who everybody wanted. And so it fit the narrative. And secondly, and very importantly, to his credit, he was going to win New Hampshire. I mean, it was clear. I mean, he was... 25 points up in New Hampshire, he's going to win. And, and so, well, he won Iowa, he won New Hampshire, no one has ever won Iowa New Hampshire, and not won the nomination, race is over. So within eight hours after coming within eight votes, coming in, I, how much money I spent on television in Iowa in 2012? $23,000. <laughs> okay. But we, and we won because we connected with the voters and we were what folks were looking for at that, at that point. And within a very short period of time, we were not even in the race. It was, it was, a, it was a real wake up uh, call for me as to you know, how important certain things are. And number one, uh, you know, Mitt had all the powers and wheels of the media lined up and ready to roll. Well, the interesting thing, looking back on it now, is he still had, yeah, he was, he was the guy, everyone wanted him, he eventually, Got it, right? But he had to work. And don't sell yourself short here, right? I mean, you still won 11 states. You got 4 million votes, second only to Mitt Romney. And yes, second place is second place in, in, in politics. I guess my point is, you came out of nowhere, 2%, you know, just days before Iowa, and you were the second place finisher for the Republican well, I, nomination. Yeah, right? I would, I, I'll, I'll sort of tell the rest of the story. So we go to New Hampshire and we, had, we, we came in second, uh, which didn't give us a ton of momentum going into New Hampshire. And New Hampshire is just not my state. I mean, it's just not. 53% of the people who voted in the New Hampshire primary were not Republicans because there was no Democratic primary. And so you had all these Democrats and independents in open primary. You could vote either side. And so Romney at Huntsman did a tremendous job of just recruiting Democrats and independents to vote. And so we had no shot. And, and so we went to South Carolina, which was the next state, and that was just one of those fluke moments where Newt Gingrich had his moment of castigating John King and the media for calling him out on having three wives. Well, not at the same time. But right. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, you know, and, and, and asked a really creepy, nasty question, and Gingrich did a Trump on him, is what he did, and just pounded him. And all of a sudden, you know, now Gingrich was the alternative to Romney, and he won South Carolina. So here I am now having, and by the way, I was announced the winner of the Iowa caucuses the morning of the South Carolina primary, for all the good that did. And, uh, and so it's now Romney and Gingrich, because Gingrich won 
South Carolina. It's now Romney and Gingrich going to Florida, which stuck its nose in and, and illegally jumped in in front of, uh, of, uh, of Nevada, uh, of the first four states. And that was sort of the, this battle of the titans going on in Florida. They both had the money. I didn't. Um, and something happened. This is the, sort of the strange thing, weird things that go on in the race that you probably don't even know about. But uh, I got called, I went home because Mitt Romney released his tax returns. I said, what's that to do? Why did you have to go home? Because Mitt Romney released his tax returns. Because I had not released mine, and I was now the only kid, not that anybody cared to see my tax returns, but uh, I, was, they, I was getting the question, why don't you release your tax I got to yeah, do it. Yeah. Well, I don't have an account. I do TurboTax, I, mean, I do my own taxes. <laughs> and so I had to go home and really get my taxes. And so I figured, well, I'm not going to Florida. I'll take a day off. I hadn't been home in almost a month. And so I get in the plane. I fly home to do my taxes. And um, that night, my daughter, Bella, who's uh, at that point uh, two years old, gets deathly ill. And uh, she had almost died. In fact, she did die. She actually died. Her heart stopped, and she stopped breathing twice, and we had to revive her when she was smaller. And she was having the same kind of situation here. And so we rushed her to the hospital. And uh, she had pneumonia. And I remember we brought her in, and they x-rayed her, uh, her lungs. And her lungs were completely full of fluid. Uh, they were just solid on the x-ray. And she said, she has pneumonia. It's going to be a really hard night. And uh, it was late at night, but the rest of the night was going to be hard. And, and so we, uh, we, we sat in the, uh, in the hospital room. Uh, and we were, it was like four in the morning. And so my, I called my staff and said, I'm canceling, I'm not going back to Florida, I'm canceling this weekend, we're suspending the campaign. And uh, they said, well, you just can't suspend your campaign. I mean, you just lost, you've lost now three states. Well, you actually won one, but everybody thinks you've lost three states. And you're losing Florida and people are gonna think you're gonna go. <laughs> I said, well, I don't wanna involve any personal stuff. I mean, they said, well, let me just ask you this. Do you want people to pray for your daughter? I said, yeah, I do. So just announce to people, you know, that Bella's sick and ask people to pray for her. And just leave it at that. And so we did. And uh, so we sat after this hustle and bustle. It's just Karen and me in the hospital with our daughter for 24 hours praying as she struggled to breathe. And um, long story short, the next morning, uh, the night was not as bad as we thought it was going to be. And the next morning, they took a chest x-ray. And this little girl who has trouble coughing, has trouble, has, no, has, has chronic pulmonary disease, uh, her lungs were perfectly clear. She had no pneumonia, uh, which is a miracle, period. But it's particularly a miracle when you have a, a kid at that situation. And so we took that as a very strong sign from the Lord that uh, this was not over yet. And we waited around 24 hours just to see whether whether she was going to stay stable, and she was. And so Sunday uh, afternoon, we decided to go back out on the campaign trail. And uh, I called my staff and said, let's, uh, let's forget about Florida. It's in a couple of days. Let's move on. And Nevada, it's a heavily Mormon state. And Romney was going to do well there. And so the next was Missouri, Minnesota, and Colorado. So let's, I said, let's go to Missouri. And um, so we packed up and said, well, let's, we'll do an event Monday morning in Missouri. So we went to St. Charles County Community College in, outside of St. Louis. I'll never forget, we got there. We had less than 24 hours to put the event together. And um, I remember showing up nervous that there would be nobody there and drove onto the, onto the campus and I see all these people outside the hall. And from a distance, you could see it. And I was panicked. I said, ah, oh. you know, our advanced people, they couldn't even get the doors open, right? I mean, we probably didn't communicate with the college. I was freaking out. So I'm calling my staff saying, get the doors open so people get in the hall. And, and they didn't know anything about it. So I showed up, and my advanced guy walks up. And I said, I said, get the doors open. He said, what are you talking about? I said, get the doors open so these people can get in there. He said, the doors are open. This is the overflow. And... I walked in, it was one of the biggest crowds we had. We hadn't had crowds like this since we were in Iowa toward the end. And I'll, I'll end with this. We got up, it was, a, it was a gymnasium, just packed with people. Huge energy. 
two things I want to remark about. One was, I'll never forget, uh, my daughter has trisomy 18, which means she has an extra 18th chromosome in every cell in her body, which caused all sorts of genetic uh, developmental abnormalities. It's, uh, trisomies are not uncommon. Uh, they are uncommon for children who have trisomy disorders of various different chromosomes to survive. There are only three, there can be trisomy one, two, three, all of them, you can have a trisomy of any, but only three, if, if that happens in, in utero, survive. And that's trisomy 21, 18, and 13. If you have trisomy anything else, it's a miscarriage. The child can't survive. Uh, 21 is the most famous, it's called Down syndrome. So my daughter has a disability similar to Down syndrome, only much more severe, uh, physically, mentally, etc. And so, um, so I get up there and I look around, and there is this big, tall, blonde guy. I'll never forget. I can see him in my in my mind's eye right now. And he's standing there, and on his shoulder is a little four or five year old Down syndrome little girl, and she's waving this sign as much as she. And the sign says, I'm for Bella's dad. And in the front row, I'd never noticed this before, were four or five people in wheelchairs. I'd never noticed that before. And throughout the rest of the campaign, people with disabilities were at every one of my events. And what I heard over and over and over again uh, was how much they appreciated that someone running for president would suspend their campaign because of someone like them. That they were important enough to be seen as worth it. And I think that message got across. Yeah, yeah it's remarkable. Um, you, you've touched on this in a lot of different ways so far in this conversation. You're at Georgetown University right now, right? Jesuit school. The notion of service to others is central to the Jesuit mission, and it's, you know, I think everyone in here would agree, beat over everyone's heads repeatedly, right? But I guess I've, I've, I've seen lots of iterations of this discussion in my 20 years in politics. The role of faith in public life, right? You clearly embrace it. Other people don't so much. I guess talk about that a little bit and how it impacts your worldview, your, your time in public life? Look, uh, I'm not two people. I'm one person. I mean, I know there's some people who feel they can sort of check who you are when you walk in to the door and, you know, you go to your job and you, you, you become somebody else. Um, I don't think that works very well. And, uh, I don't think it's real. I am one person, and I'm a person who um, the most important thing in my life is my relationship with Jesus Christ and my faith. That's the most important thing in my life. Why? Because, look, I'm, I don't know whether you want to call it Pascal's wager or just, just simple mathematics. Yeah, I'm going to be here for a little blink of an eye. I'm going to be somewhere else for a long, long, long time. That's much more important to me. And so I, when I... Bella taught me this lesson. We had a little boy who was born back in 1996. His name was Gabriel, uh, and he died shortly after he was born. So we had been through this before Bella, and uh, only this time our son did in fact die. Um, and I realized going through that trauma, the pain and the anger of losing the son, that the thing that, that pulled me out of it was the certain knowledge that my son was in heaven. And in the end, if you think about it as a father, what's the most important role? It's to get your kid to heaven. And so it just gave me perspective that in the end, that's what matters. And so the idea that you would, that you would walk away from that central element of who you are, and not just in your, and what the ultimate goal is of salvation, but what God's teachings are, what the moral law is, what the truth is, and that you abandon that for some other reason, temporal in nature, is absurd to me. How? Why would you do that? What, what to be gained from that? There is, I believe, and that there is truth. It's discernible. 
I believe my faith teaches the truth when it comes to moral precepts. And uh, I think the natural law and uh, bears that out. And so I'm going to stand and fight for those things because I believe that that is the way man is supposed to live and that, that men live better and healthier and, uh, and orient themselves toward the true, the good, and the beautiful and toward the eternal when you do that. And now you say, is that part of politics? The answer is, of course, yes. Is, does it mean that I'm going to preach that Jesus Christ should be your Savior? Of course not. That's not part of politics. But it is to say that we should, uh, we should love one another, we should care for the poor, that we should stand up for the dignity of every human life, that we should understand the natural uh, uh, bond between the man and the woman for the purpose of having and raising children, forming a good and healthy society. All of those things I know are true, and, and I, if I deny them because, well, it's not popular, or it's not, it's not, uh, it's not, politically right thing to do. And I, I'm, I'm betraying myself, and I'm betraying everything I believe in. I can't do that. I won't do that. And, and I know that there are consequences to that. I know that there are positions that I hold and things that I say that upset people and people don't like them. I don't want, I don't say them to upset anybody. Uh, and when I do upset people, and if I do speak, and I have in the past, I'm sure, and I know I have said some things that indelicately, to say the least, and you know I've apologized for that. I mean I'm not I'm not here to offend anybody, but I am here to try to do what I believe in my heart is best. And I, I always say to my liberal friends, I respect that you fight for what you believe is best, and and I admire you for that. I don't agree with you, but I admire you for for fighting for what you believe is right. And I hope that you can have the same respect and even admiration for someone who. Feels different. Um, I want to fast forward a little bit and, and get through this most recent campaign so this way we have enough time to open you can it up. Go, you can honest. go through this one pretty quick. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. Um, as you are considering a run for 2016, do you notice the major difference in the electorate, in the national mood? What was any differences, any similarities, and how did that play into your calculus? Yeah, I'm a conservative, but I'm not stupid. So the answer is yes, I, I did notice that. I think everybody noticed it. I wrote a book, I, in fact, the gentleman actually signed one earlier. I wrote a book in the, um, uh, the spring of 2011, no, not 2014, uh, called Blue Collar Conservative, Recommitting to an American Works. And I wrote that book talking about my experiences in 2012 where I really ran as a blue collar conservative. I ran as a more populist economic message. People don't really, a lot of folks don't know that because they like, oh, Rick was a, you know, one of these social conservatives. I ran as a very much talking about manufacturing, talking about uh, trade, talking about a lot of this, you know, immigration. And long story short, I, I wrote this book chronicling my experience, but also laying out a path for the future as to where I think the country needs to go, much less the Republican and conservative movement. And I will tell the story, I, I didn't tell it during the campaign, but now I'm not writing, so I can. Um, but I, I, I did a uh, event at Citizens Bank Park in Philadelphia, and uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer covered my event the, during the book tour. And the next day I get a call uh, from, uh, from Ed Rendell. And he said, hey, I read the article in the paper about you. I said, yeah. He said, smartest thing I've heard from a Republican in 35 years. I said, really? He said, absolutely right. He says, brilliant. He said, this is the exact right message for the country. He said, he said, you, he said you will bring this country together. He said, I don't know if you're thinking about running for president, but I hope you do. And, and I hope you do. I hope you run on this. Because if you run on this, you can win. And so uh, I believe the message is the right message. And I'll, I'll tell another interesting story. Two months after that, I'm in New York. And I was invited to come by somebody's office to see him in New York. And so I show up in his office in the Trump Tower. And I walk into his office. 
and he's sitting behind his desk holding a copy of my book, Blue Collar Conservative. And I walk in and he holds, waves the book at me, doesn't get up, of course, but he waves the book at me. <laughs> and, and he says, uh, I read your book. Now I had, I mean, I, I don't think I'd ever met him before. Uh, if I did, it was one of those, you know, passing things. I, I never really talked to him. And um, I looked at him and said, you know, the hell you read my book. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, no, I read your book. It's a good book. I said, you didn't read my book. He said, no, I actually, I read your book. And so by then I was at, at his desk and I sat down. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to quiz him on my book. <laughs> and so I did. And he read my book. <laughs> And, and if you look at, now, again, not style. I'm talking about what substance is there. It's very much a blue-collar populist message. And I'm not saying Donald Trump stole, no. <laughs> it's the right message. It's a message that says there are millions of Americans, in fact, the vast majority of Americans, who feel like neither political party cares a whit about them. They're all interested in their own little groups of folks that they have to get in order to win, and the money they have to attract in order to win. And there's all these Americans, I always talked about the 70% of Americans, age 25 to 65, who don't have a college degree. That's the number. 74%, actually, to be exact. I was fact-checked on this, because I said 70, and the Washington Post, or PolitiFact, or whatever it's called, they, they went after me, and in the end they said, oh, it's 74%. He was right. Uh, and the reality is that if you're one of those 74%, you're sitting there saying, What's, what are you guys talking about? Oh, you can talk about, oh, we're going to send you to college. I'm not going to college. What, what's happened to my job? What's happened to my paycheck? What's happened to my benefits? What's happened to my quality of life? What's going on with my family? What's happening in my community? What's going on in the popular culture that makes life harder to raise my kids? All of these things, and people are saying, nobody's talking about me. Nobody cares about me. Oh yeah, you're gonna give me a minimum wage increase. Great, but that means all my prices are gonna go up. Their people aren't stupid. They realize what that means. And part of it is, is econ economic message. Part of it is a cultural message. And yes, part of it is an immigration message. And Trump hasn't talked at all about the cultural stuff, but he has on the other two, and I think that's what's resonated with people. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I do believe we live in this populist age, right? We're not on the left versus right, we're sort of on an up versus down, right? That message, which, and I agree, you were very consistent in delivering that message, it never broke through for you this time around, right? And it really struck, I don't pretend to understand Republican politics, I think a lot of people could say that this cycle, but, what I do know is in 2000, in 2000, John McCain was the runner-up. He starts off as the front runner next time. In 2008, Mitt Romney was the was the runner-up. He started off as the front runner. You were the runner-up in 2012. You didn't necessarily start. You didn't start off as the front runner, yeah. right? Were you not? Did, 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 did folks just not take you seriously? Was it too crowded? What What was the difference? What, what I, I don't. I mean, someone will write a book about that. I don't know, but. Um, I mean, I could give you lots of different, yeah. lots of different reasons, uh, but I don't know if any of them are true. To be yeah. honest with you, I mean, maybe they all are. Maybe in part they are. Uh, I think part of it was, it it was a different look. Anybody who had any in the Republican Party, anybody who had any experience, any knowledge, any background, any sense, any accomplishment, you were toast. You had no chance. I mean, the more experience you had, the more involved you were in government, even the more success you had, the less likely you were going to get votes. And there was just this, we're bad as hell, we're not gonna take any more attitude. And I think that was part of it. People were just tired, they didn't want anything to do with the past. So if you were the guy that came in second last time, you were the past. We want, we want someone new, we want someone fresh, we don't care where they, we just blow the place up. We, we saw polls that said people would rather blow up the Republican Party than beat the Democrat in the general election. That's how mad people. And so if you were any part of that, even though obviously I was running as the outsider against right. the party, it just didn't matter. Uh, and you know, 
I, I remember speaking at caucus nights in Iowa. And I went to, I think, five different caucus locations. I never got louder applause and more enthusiastic responses, but nobody voted for us. I mean, I couldn't tell you the number of people. I mean, it's just, we love you, but we're not going to vote for you. Because we just, we, it's time to just blow this place up. And, you know, you just, sometimes you just have to tip your hands and say, okay, you guys, probably, you know better than me. Because you know, we, we got to trust, trust the American people on this one. And, um, and I, I think that was part of it. I think part of it is that um, I never was the favorite of the news media. And, and uh, either the left or the right news media. Uh, and it was obvious why I wasn't the favorite of the left news media. Right? I mean, that doesn't take a whole lot of figuring out the difference. But on the right, um, I wasn't the favorite of the of of your uh, establishment Republicans, your Wall Street, your big donor class. Why? Because I was an economic populist, right? I had I had a more economic populist message that just didn't sit with the Wall Street Journal and didn't sit with that group. Uh, and secondly, I was a very ardent social conservative, uh, which makes a lot of those folks really uncomfortable. And so the donor class, I was sort of the last guy in the world that they were going to support. So money was always an issue for me. And, and, and of course, the media talks to the establishment folks. And, and they wanted to block someone like me. And, and that's why they designed this entire Republican caucus, I mean, the entire Republican primary system, around trying to block someone like me. You were very critical of the debate structure, yeah. right, which kept you off of the main stage for... Well, it wasn't just the debate structure. I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, but it was it was the fact that they limited debates, number one. Uh, number two, the way they structured the, the primaries and compressing them uh, to make money more of a, 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 a important. <clears throat> and the way they, they, they did the debates. Uh, the idea that nine months before an election, you're going to choose who the top candidates are by national polls is is like saying we're going to draw it's, it's the equivalent of just drawing names out of a hat and say that's those people are now the top people it's almost the same but here's what here's what i figured out and it's not hard to figure out why did the media want the top 10 in the national poll and there there were two reasons they wanted the top 10 or top 8 but I'm picking up why did they want those in their in their main event and not everybody else Come on, why do you think they wanted the top eight? Premium. <clears throat> yeah, you got it right. CNN, Fox, all these, they're businesses. And they're interested in eyeballs, ratings. And so they wanted to put the folks who would draw the biggest ratings. That's what this was all about. And they wanted to keep it small, and I heard this many times, you'd be surprised, they, they'd even say it. No, we can't have this many people because it wouldn't allow for a good show. They were concerned about entertaining the folks so they could keep the ratings up. So the RNC, hand, with their imprimatur, handed the media the ability to basically decide half the field should be in the race and the other half shouldn't be. And ultimately, nobody was in the who, nobody who participated in any of the junior debates ended up surviving past the first couple of primaries. Um. Trump obviously was also a force that no one could strategize around, right? Like, how do you prep for some someone or something like that phenomenon? A couple days or maybe a couple weeks uh, before the caucus, you were quoted saying, you understand voters want a new face who will stir things up, but that this is too important a time to trust a pig in a poke. What do you mean by that? I mean, what do we really know about what Donald Trump is going to do? Uh, he says some things that I like when he says it. Says some things I don't like. Uh, but I have no, I have no doubt that many of those things are going to change between now and the fall, right? I, I, the best way I can describe Donald Trump, and I don't mean this in a negative way at all. I mean he's a deal maker, and he's a he's a he's a. Everybody say, oh, you know, he's just this crude. He's a smart guy, and I'm sure he sat down, <clears throat> read my book. 
And uh, <laughs> no, I'm sure he sat down and looked at the situation in this country and said, okay, I gotta, I gotta get a deal with you. You know, here's the electorate that I'm gonna be dealing with. How can I make a deal with these guys? What do I need to do? What terms do I need to, uh, to put in this contract so I can get, their, you know, get them to sign the, the, the bottom of the contract? And so he went out there and, uh, and, and found the issues that he felt would galvanize an angry population. I mean, he certainly, everybody knew they were angry, so he's good at anger. And he's good at, uh, at, at, at inflaming folks. And so what are the issues that I can get? He did, in my opinion, he did what Barack Obama and the Democrats do really, really well. They segment the population, and they try to maximize the votes from, from various groups of people. And the Democrats do this to a T. I mean, you know that, right? We gotta get this vote, and then this vote, and then this vote. We gotta get 80, 90% of them, 70% of them, and, and then we win. Now, if Trump does that, ah, oh, he's a bad guy. He's terrible. He's dividing America. What? So the Democrats do every election. And they get away with it, it's fine. But if you do it on the other side, oh, he's a racist. Oh, if I do it on one side, I'm not a racist. If I do it on the other side, I am a racist. That's just crazy. And he's doing, he's taking a page out of Barack Obama's book. And he's saying, here's the group I need. I need to get 75% of their vote. And that's no different saying I need to get 95% of this vote. Is it? Is it? I don't think so. And, and that's what he's doing. And, and he's trying to put a deal together. Here's my concern is that after he gets to the Republican nomination, well, he's got a whole new set of folks he has to get a deal with. And so now he's, I, what's he gonna say after that? I don't know. Maybe, will he stay with what he's saying? Probably not. Let's come back to this point in a second. Because I, I was struck by your decision, he boycotts the last debate, the Iowa debate, right? And you're on the, the pregame debate, right? And then you and Mike Huff, he boycotts it, throws a rally for veterans, and you and Mike Huckabee go and join them. Raise six million bucks. I mean, is someone going to throw a rally for veterans? I wasn't doing anything at that time. Because uh, I had sort of just done my thing. And uh, he invited me to come by to, uh, to raise money for vets. So I went by to help raise money for vets. I mean, to me, it was just as simple as that. I mean, I, people say, oh, you know, he supports Trump. Well, it's obviously I, did, I wasn't supporting Trump. Uh, but that doesn't mean I can't support what he does. And you'd say, well, you're detracting away from the main debate. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel bad about that. <laughs> Didn't go so well in Iowa this no. time around. You get out of the race. You endorse Marco Rubio very quickly. Yeah. Um, didn't go so well for Marco Rubio at the end of the day. Kiss of death, I guess. Have you, uh, have you endorsed any of the remaining candidates? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not intending on endorsing anybody else. Uh, I wouldn't try to damage their campaign by doing so. <laughs> <laughs> so if Donald Trump is the Republican Party nominee, will you vote for him? Yes, I will. I'll vote for whoever the Republican nominee is. Uh, and to the extent that I can, uh, or they want to, I'll, I'll try to help them. I'm going to come back with some closing questions at the very end, but let's open it up now. We've, we've got some time. Thank you for coming to George County and sharing your perspective with us. Uh, I just have to say, before I get into my question, uh, I just appreciate the fact that your uh, values and your political beliefs are rooted in what your faith and what you genuinely believe in. Um, sort of related to that, uh, I know that a while back in 2003, you had a pretty well-known remark comparing homosexuality to uh, incest, um, but, um, pedophilia, uh, quote unquote, man on dog. Uh, and on, in your 2012 campaign, you had implied that um, if same-sex marriage were legalized in the United States, that polygamy would follow soon after. Um, we're a little over a year now with uh, legal same-sex marriage in this country. Um, also, the leader of the Catholic Church, Pope Francis, has said that uh, if a person is gay, and I quote, who am I to judge? Uh, so um, do you believe, do you still stand by that? Do you believe that polygamy is coming soon to the United States? Well, let me say a couple of things. First off, I didn't compare. I mean, if you read the quote, and I encourage people to go back and actually read the entire quote, uh, what I said is that the Supreme Court changes the standard by which 
uh, of privacy uh, from uh, of sec of, of privacy covering se sexual relationships from the institution of marriage. That if you do so with the institution of marriage, the government cannot have any laws that that, that involve itself in, with in, in a marital relationship, sexual activities in a marital relationship. If they change it to consent, consenting adults, and if I said, if you have the right to uh, uh, sexual activity, uh, consensual sexual activity, then you have the right to, and I listed all of those things. The reporter put the word gay in front of sexual activity. I never said the word gay, because that wasn't the issue. The issue was a legal standard as to whether the court was going to change the standard from marriage to consenting adults. And by the way, if you take a look at what I said, the quote, just the paragraph of what I said, and then you compare it to Justice Scalia's dissent, it's almost word for word what Scalia said. And, uh, and by the way, if you go back to the previous decision on, sodom on the sodomy case, which was the Bowers decision, and you look at the majority opinion written by Justice White, and you see the quote, you, you see a quote almost identical to what I said. Because both of them came to the same conclusion, which is, if the issue is that the Constitution protects consent, consent, consensual sexual activity, then of course all of these things are eventually going to be legalized. How do you how do you say, well, no, this consensual activity is okay and this is not okay? You can't. If the standard is consent, you have to be an adult and you have to be consenting. Now that's adult. That's that's also going to be questioned. And so that's where I get into polygamy. How can you say that two men can marry, two women can marry, a man and woman can marry, but three can't. Why? I mean, what legal standard do you say that that's under the rubric of the same-sex marriage decision? How do you say, well, two is okay, but three is not? You can't. And so, I mean, legally you can't. Now, if you passed a law that said we're going to legalize same-sex marriage, well, Congress can pass a law and say we're going to legalize same-sex marriage between, you know, uh, three, you know, two two people, and that's it. We can pass any law we want, right? But when the court passes a law, which is what they did, which they shouldn't do, but when the court passes an edict like this and creates a right, it's a broad sweeping right that has legal reasoning and ramifications that flow from it. Whereas when the Congress says, it says, here's what it is, and it's nothing more than that, we can limit it. Courts can't limit it. And that's the problem with courts doing this, is that they open up Pandora's box. As opposed to the people doing it, they can say, we say this is okay and this isn't okay. Why? Because we say so. And the public can say that. But you can't do that in a court decision. Because you have legal reasoning that supports why you say what you say. And that legal reasoning can be used in other cases. And that's why there are, I forget the number now, but there's many uh, cases right now in the courts working their way up all on polyamorous, and uh, I think, I could be wrong, I think one has already said, one judge has already said that they're legal under this opinion, and they're coming. And so, I, and I ask this of college students all the time. Uh, give me, if you are for uh, same-sex marriage, give me your moral and legal reasoning why we shouldn't allow three people to get married. What's your, what's your, what's your argument against it? Give me your legal reasoning argument against it under the decision. What is it? Raise your hand. Just somebody, raise your hand. Nobody? There you go, sir. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, there's benefits? Benefits what? In terms of with... Oh, this was to answer the question? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> the delayed response, I'm sorry. Um, I'm thinking about it in terms of legal benefits. I'm not sure. I don't know enough about the background, but I'd say benefits for two people versus three people or more. I, I mean, in terms of a legal argument, I'm not sure. I, yeah, I, I mean, so two people shouldn't get benefits, and one, what says, what's the difference? Whether two or one or six or seven or eight, what's the difference? I mean, it. The structure of the law, I, I'm not. But, I mean, if. if if the, if the standard is you should be able to love and marry whoever you want, that's what everybody says. I mean, I suspect even many, many people in this room agree with that. Then if you love two people, why can't you marry two people? Or three, or four, or six, or eight, or ten? What's, why not? I mean, what, there's, 
What's the legal reasoning behind it? And that's, that's, again, goes to the court decision. What's the legal reasoning behind it? And of course, you also have, what's the moral reason? Because if, if marriage isn't what marriage is, and see, I happen to believe marriage is something, and that is a union between a man and a woman, then you can call other things marriage that doesn't make it marriage. You can call it that, but it isn't in my mind. It never will be in my mind. Uh, because marriage is a certain thing. And, and it is a union of a man and a woman because man and women are made complementary. And for, for and as nature, it's natural. It's how, how they were made. For the purposes of um, forming that unique union, um, and it's a unique union that is the only one that can produce children. And so, uh, which is necessary for civilization to continue. And so that's why marriage is there. That's what it's always been there for. It's, 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 it's self-revelatory as to what it is. We can, man can construct and say, no, that's not what it is. We want to make it something else. You can say anything. You can say anything is something different than what it is. It doesn't make it different. But once you've done that, and you say, well, here's the grounds upon which we've decided that, then be, be prepared for all the consequences that come from that. And, and it's coming. And I suspect most of your generation are going to be okay with it. Right? Yeah. Hey, could you speculate on the future of religious liberty in this country, given the possibility of a leftist Supreme Court judge taking the place of Antonin Scalia? Um, and this is going to be a. Uh, I always said this election changed when Scalia died. To me, this election is all about the United States Supreme Court. And if. Uh, Hillary Clinton is the nominee and the, and the president. Uh, she will replace Scalia with someone like a Kagan or a Sotomayor. Assuming, uh, I think it's, I shouldn't say a safe assumption, but excuse me, the likelihood that, uh, that the Senate will, certainly Democrats will pick up seats if Hillary wins and likely control, be, be in control. And so there's a, there's a good chance that they will be able to get a, maybe not so, Maybe not someone as as as, uh, as left, but probably in the Kagan Sotomayor world. And then I have no doubt that that Breyer and Ginsburg will retire, and you'll have five liberal justices under the age of fifty-five, which means for the next twenty-five years the court will rewrite the Constitution of the United States. Now you can say, "Oh, that's hyperbole." It's not. They look. You ask every single one of them what their vision is, what their how they view the Constitution, they will all say the same thing. Whoever those three in the future will be and the two that are on there right now. Well, the four that are on there. The Constitution is a what? A living, breathing document. In other words, it's what we says it, say it is. So if we say that the Constitution says the Second Amendment isn't really what it says, that you don't have a personal right to, to bear arms, that, that the government can do confiscate your guns, then that's what they're going to say. And if you don't think they will, read the Heller decision, the dissent. Because the dissent in Heller says that. That it's not a personal right. And that the government can do whatever they want with your gun. And you say, well, that'll never happen. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that will happen. That'll be the, one of the first decisions that'll be handed down. And then you'll have the issue of, of, uh, of religious liberty. Look, I mean, it's pretty clear that the justices in the, uh, in the, in the same-sex marriage decision sort of gave short shrift to religious liberty. That's not a, it's not a concern. We're not really concerned about it. Uh, you're going to see a, uh, an assault on religious liberty. Like we, we're seeing it now, and you'll see it even more profoundly. Uh, and uh, again, you'll see a Supreme Court that will create more rights, get rid of, get rid of rights that they don't think are relevant anymore, and fundamentally remake the country. Now, People don't believe that, but I, but it's going to happen, and the consequences are going to be pretty dire. And when I say dire, look, I think that I always say that the difference between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, or maybe the liberals and the conservatives, because maybe that's maybe it's too old, maybe too partisan to say it that way, uh, is what revolution did you descend from? And I believe the Republicans and the conservatives have believe we descended from the American Revolution. And the American Revolution is a revolution that was based on this key phrase. Anybody want to recite the phrase for me? 
We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal and endowed by their creator, creator with certain unalienable rights. You see, the American Revolution was a revolution about equality and liberty and about God-given rights. The idea that, number one, is there is a creator. There is a God. There are laws that, and, and a moral code by which that, those laws are, are, are and, and those rights are bestowed upon us. And the government's role is to protect those rights. All right? It should be limited in nature to protect those rights. That's, that's the American Revolution. Now, the French Revolution was about three words. Anybody can, come on, you're Georgetown. You know the three words of the French Revolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't want them in French. I want them in French. <laughs> okay. you're, you're in George Sash, you're going to show off to me. <laughs> Give it to me in English. Liberty, equality, fraternity. Liberty, okay, we're all we're good. Equality, we're good with those. Those are two good words we use here in America. Same thing. What's this third word? Okay, so there are a bunch of Greeks and togas over in, in France. What do they mean by fraternity? What do they mean by fraternity? Brotherhood. Brotherhood. What's that mean? Why do they use the word brotherhood? The power of mankind over the over the Brotherhood. Fraternity. Instead of paternity. Right? America was about paternity. Our rights came from the Father. Came from God. Fraternity means rights come from man. It can dictate rights. For his fellow man. And it was a secular revolution. It was a godless revolution. It was a revolution, as you know, I'm sure you studied. They burned churches, they killed clerics. And they spread that revolution, that secular, godless revolution through Bonaparte throughout Europe. And it is, in fact, what Europe is today. It is a godless continent, certainly Western Europe is. Churches are museums run primarily by the state, part of the tourist trade. Nobody goes to church in Europe. Seven percent of Western Europeans go to church. 7%. In the European Union, the word God is not found, and it is a completely secular society where man establishes rights and rules. And so my point is, what the Supreme Court will do is, as you heard Ginsburg, Breyer, they all talk about it, is adopt European-style rights and import them here to America. What does that mean? The French Revolution comes to America. Now, is the French Revolution hostile to faith? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Has it effectively wiped out faith in Europe? Yes, it has. You can say, well, that won't happen in America. I'm sure they said that 200 years ago in Europe. But it will. It will. And so that's what's at stake in my mind in this election. And... You can say, well, Europe is doing just fine. What is Europe leading the world in today? Where is Europe keeping anyone safe today? What is Europe doing except being co-opted, corrupted, and displaced now by immigrants who have a fundamentally different culture than they do? And they don't even have the courage to fight on that. Europe is dying. The European population of Europe decreases by half every generation. Why? Because they're only having one kid for every two people. They're dying. They're not leaving. They're not fighting for anything or against anybody other than just to keep their stuff. But they're not going to leave. And if that is imported here, just like Europe died after having led the world for 500 years, this place will die and become just like Europe, which is a group of folks who are concerned about their own self, because that's all that matters, because there is no tomorrow. There is no after. There is no thing, nothing to live for. There's nothing greater or bigger than self. There's no cause to fight for. There's no mission, vision, that's bigger than whether I get to have vacation time and don't have to work too hard and have the state support me in all the things I want to do. That's, that's sort of how I, it's, it's sort of, crass and maybe a little uh, rough around the edges, but that's sort of how I see this transformation. And, and I don't mean to say that anybody who is on the other side, that that's how they want America to end up. I just think we have to have a more honest assessment when we look across the ocean and see what we see and see, do we really want that to be America? 
And if it is, who's going to fight for the world? Who's going to keep us free? Who's going to stand up for truth and freedom? They're not. Nobody in the U.S. They don't want to. And that's coming here. Soon, I suspect. Go ahead. Uh, so sorry, I'm going to make you talk about uh, Trump one more time uh, before we get out of here. Boy, it sounds like the campaign again. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just curious. It seems um, as if he's carrying a lot of, of your people, and it's people that you've advocated for um, your whole life, um, whether that was in Congress and Senate uh, or on the campaign trail. Um, and you kind of embody that. But um, he's got a completely different background from you, and he's carrying that people. I mean, he's a New Yorker, born with a lot of money, and kind of doesn't embody those ideals. So how do you think, I mean, obviously you know this subset of people very well. How do you think they've been able to get behind somebody like that? I, I, I think his... Uh... His tough guy demeanor, like, you, you see this, unfortunately, all too often in, in, in world history when people are frustrated and they don't think the system's working, what do they resort to? Someone who will make the system work. Now, not the way the system's supposed to work, but, you know, we'll make the trains run on time. They, they seek a more authoritarian figure, someone who's tough, someone who seems to command the stage and not be deterred by anything. Uh, they're not looking for someone who's reasonable, rational, negotiates, compromises, none of those things. We've done that. We've been doing that. It's not working for me. And there's a whole group of people out there who feel that way. And, and I don't know if you saw that uh, they just reported that 60,000 Democrats in the state of Pennsylvania switch parties to become Republicans vote for Donald Trump. Uh, that doesn't happen very often in Pennsylvania. That's a lot of people. And I think Pennsylvania is one of those states that people think, oh, the Democrats will win Pennsylvania next time. Don't count on that one. Uh, I think Trump will have tremendous appeal if he can nominate in Pennsylvania. Uh, and I think he will in Michigan and Ohio and a lot of other places. Uh, so it, it, and among Democrats. Uh, look, and I think one of the issues that will be most attractive, I know people don't believe this, will be the issue of immigration. And now I'm, I don't like Trump's rhetoric on immigration, but his policies on immigration, not for Mexico building the wall, but, but his policy on, on restricting uh, legal immigration as well as returning those who are here illegally and, and securing the borders, I think is a position that a lot of folks in America who have seen their wages flatline for the last 20 years as we brought in, get this number for 35 million people have come to this country in the last 20 years, legally and illegally. It's more than any 20 year period in American history, not even close. More than any period in American history. And what percentage of those folks are wage earners? Folks competing against the people of the 70% of Americans who don't have a college degree. You see, when most of the immigrants come into this country, they're not competing against you for jobs that you're trying to hold. Let's just be honest about it. There aren't that many folks coming over who are going to compete against someone coming out of Georgia. But they are going to compete against someone who wants a job at the factory or wants a job you know, at, at, uh, at Walmart or someplace else. That's what they're competing against. And they're holding wages down. They, this, and you say, well, other things are doing it too. Well, maybe. But you know, folks aren't high-level economists, but most people understand the supply and demand idea. And when you bring in... 35 million people in this country, 90% of whom are wage earners, to compete against other wage earners, and wages aren't going up, maybe people can sort of put two and two together. And they look at the Republicans, and George Bush, and Paul Ryan, and Mitt Romney, at least before the campaign, and they say, well, you know, these guys are willing to cut deals. They're willing to let people stay and bring more people in. And why? Why are they doing that? Because businesses want it. Because businesses want to keep labor costs down. Because they want to keep their profits up. Well, what about the other side? The other side, they're for the working man, right? No. No, they're, they want to bring even more people in. Why do they want to bring more people in? It hurts the working man. Because all those people coming in are going to vote for them. So I'm going to put the votes of the people coming in ahead of the folks who are here now. 
And so they stand there and say, a pox on both of you. Nobody cares about me. And here you guys, someone coming along and saying, I care about you. And I'm going to stand up to both these, these folks. And I'm not anti-immigrant. I always ask this question. What is the purpose of an immigration system? What is the purpose of an immigration system? I'll start the sentence, you finish it. An immigration system should be in the best interest of? America. Come on. America. Anybody disagree with that? Immigration system should be in the best interest of? America. America. Anybody disagree with that? Is it? Most Americans say it's not. And, and here's what really ticks them off. That if you say that the immigration system is not working for Americans, you're a bigot. You're a bad guy. And they're sitting there saying, I'm getting screwed, and I can't even speak up because if I do, you call me a bigot. I don't hate anybody. I just want a good job. I don't want people coming in. And I can tell you, I go to those, I go to, I mean, I've been to blue collar towns. That's what I do. And I hear it all the time. And yet, and the frustration, you can't even measure the frustration. When, when, when you see folks in the elite talking about how it's not nice and you're in, no one's taking their job. And they know that. And that's what frustrates them. I agree with everything you said 110%. Right? I say to people in my party, who think Donald Trump is a godsend for Democrats and that he's easily beatable and we're going to win by the biggest. I think that's a laughable proposition. I worry as a Democrat about losing states like Michigan and Ohio and Pennsylvania because I do believe people there are so pissed off and they hear him and they say, finally, someone's looking out for me. Here's what worries me right now. I'm with what you said earlier as well. I don't know what he's for. Right? And we're going to find it'll, out. It'll change. Like, it'll change. Sure. I don't know what he's for. I actually think Donald Trump's for himself. And so I, and that, that's what I hope the Democratic argument is against him. But let me put that aside for a second. Because I also agree Democrats make a mistake when they say all Trump supporters are racist and bigots. I think that is an idiotic proposition. A lot of those folks make. were your voters four years ago. Right? And they don't like what they hear but they're willing to overlook some of it because of other reasons. Here's what worries me. We're not healing as a country right now. And there is something going on around him that's leading to these images that we are seeing every night. And yes, some people can blame the protesters and some people can blame his supporters, but there's something happening there that we're reaching a boiling point. How do we get that? How do we fix that? Well, I mean, look, this isn't new. I mean, didn't we see it in Baltimore? Didn't we see it in Ferguson? I mean, look, it's this, I mean, a lot of them are the same folks who are showing up at now at Trump rallies. And, and, and it's not the right. I mean, it's, it's the, and it's, it's not even in many cases the left. It's sort of this group of anarchists and, and that, that are out there. I mean, you, I'm sure you see them here in Georgetown every now and then. I mean, how many Guy Fox? Uh, mass have you seen wandering around here in the campus? I assume a few. But like any other college campus. I mean, there's an element out there that is, uh, is sees an opportunity in this discontent. And they're feeding upon it. And it's 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 very it, it's scary, but it's it's I think it's equally upsetting to people to say, well, Donald Trump is the reason for that. I just Look, uh, has Donald Trump said some stupid things about how you deal with protesters? Yes. Should he have said them? No. Uh, is he the reason all those people showed up in Chicago? No. Some stupid staff person decided to have a, uh, a rally in a place that you probably, if you knew anything about the city of Chicago, the area of Chicago he's in, it's in the south side of Chicago. It's a stupid place to do a rally, right? You don't do a rally there because guess what? That's where these folks are and they're going to show up. You take it out to the suburbs, makes it harder for folks to get there, and some most many people won't come. Right? I mean, that's just the reality. I remember doing a, a rally in uh, again, a staff person was in Tacoma. Anybody remember uh, what's what did they call themselves? Occupy, the Occupy movement. Remember that? Occupy. So I'm the, the Occupy was big four years ago. 
And so I'm in Tacoma, campaigning in Washington State, and I, um, and I did a rally in Tacoma outdoors, which was fine, except it was a block away from the Occupy camp. I mean, who does a rally a block away from the Occupy camp? I mean, it just says, please come. And they did. And they stood in, stood in the middle of, of my rally and just tried to shout me down for 45 minutes. And, you know, I was raised in steelworker areas. and tough, I mean, I, I'm, I'm used to people protesting me all the time. I mean, I, rep, I represent a tough district, and I hardly ever had a rally that I didn't have someone protesting trying to shout me down. You just talk through it. Just, you know, just to let them talk, and you just talk louder. And eventually they get frustrated. You make fun of them every chance you get. And they get frustrated and leave, and that's what happened. And no, no violence, no incidents. Now, I could have been Donald Trump and say, hey, you know, my guys, take out these guys. That's just, that, I, I don't agree with that. But it doesn't give them the right to go and try to be disruptive and violent in, in his event. So um, I, don't, I don't think you can blame what we've seen now as an increasing trend. And in my opinion, this president has not condemned and has, in some respects, festered. Uh, I don't think you can blame Donald Trump for that. Let's take one more question. Got a few. I got a few. Okay, right there. Um, so you talked about, you know, you developed a, a, a reputation for being a straight shooter yourself. That's something that's been very popular, um, like with the Tea Party folks. But at the same time in your career, you accomplished a lot through um, deal making and compromise, particularly in the leadership. Uh, and that, at least, you know, the optics of it seems like that's sort of fallen away now, and I'm sure there's blame to spread around. But what is your view on the, on, the, on the value of compromise in developing policy, and how do you think we can guide the country back in that direction? You know, I always talk about good compromises and bad compromises. I'll vote for a good compromise every day. I'll vote against a bad compromise every day. A good compromise, in my mind, is taking something that you believe is a, is a net positive for the country and being less positive. So it's still a net positive for the country. And it moves the country in a way that you think is gonna improve America. That's a good compromise, less of something good. A bad compromise is something you feel is bad for the country and that you're able to negotiate something that's less bad. That's a bad compromise and you shouldn't support that. Why? Because it's bad. And we shouldn't support things that you think are harmful to the country. Why would I do that? But people do. Because, oh, well, we, it's not as bad as it could have been. Oh, well, I'm not here to make things not as bad as they could be. Uh, I'm here to stop those bad things from happening that I believe are bad things and try to accomplish good things. And if it means that I have to get less of a good thing to get something done, I'll take it. And I'll come back the next day and try to get more of a good thing. And I've done that over and over. And, and you can do it if uh, if you if you have the ability to separate the person from the, the policy. And I, I think where where we've gone wrong, a, a lot a long ways wrong in Washington is that it's become so personal. And there are no relationships anymore to speak of. I don't know of anybody who has a good relationship, personal relationship, uh, on the Republican side with President Obama. I don't know of anybody. Now, maybe there is one. I don't know of anybody. Now, I do know uh, that there were Republicans who had good relationships with Bill Clinton. I do know there were Democrats who had good relationships with, with George Bush. I don't know a single Republican has a good relationship with now you can blame the Republicans, you can blame Obama, whoever you want to blame, you can go ahead and blame. But certainly blame has to fall at least partly on both. And I would make the argument, not knowing, and just, just from the fact of, of who the leader is, that the majority of the blame has to fall on the president. Why? Because he's the president. And he has to set the tone. Members of the Senate can't set the tone in Washington. The president sets the tone. Whether he's a Republican or Democrat, doesn't matter. If you're not setting a tone that I'm willing to work down and be an honest broker and work with people and set personal uh, attacks aside and not condemn your motives, not condemn your motives, 
not belittle you for the motives you have, and, and work with you, if you don't do that, then this place will never function. And so are Republicans to blame? Of course they are. But anytime things do not work in Washington, always, always, the majority of the blame is on the president. Because he's the president. And Harry Truman had it right. The buck stops there. We close with one, going back to the personal, one final question. Go back to that rally in Missouri. And if you could find that woman who held up that sign that said, I'm for Bella's Girl, name. she was four years old. A girl who Five held up that said, I'm for, okay, even better. Go up to that girl who said, I'm for Bella's dad. What would you say to her right now? Well, I tell her I love her because she's a Down syndrome little girl. And so I give her a hug and, uh, and tell her that, uh, that the country is going to be okay. But um, we got to continue to be to, to be vigilant. And look, I wouldn't say this little girl because she's a Down syndrome girl. My doubt is that she would be able to, to sort of understand the larger piece of it. But what I would say is that there's no. I mean, <clears throat> we have this idea that America is just going to continue to be great, everything's going to continue to be wonderful, and that somehow this is all guaranteed in the laws of nature that America is going to be this great, prosperous, successful country. Forever, and that's just ridiculous. It's I mean, it would. I mean, we're 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 toward the end of how most how long most civilizations are around, and do well. And you say, well, we're different. Yes, 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 we're different. What makes us different? What makes us different? What makes us different? Well, we're Americans. What's that mean? What's it mean to be an American? You're an American? You're an American? You're an American? Right? You're an American? Right? Now, you look at these three people, you say, they look like Americans? Well, what does an American look like? Americans don't look like anything. They look like everything. So what's it mean to be an American? It's a set of values and principles. We're all hyphenated Americans around here. What makes us Americans is a set of values and principles. You're not French because of values and principles. You're not Italian because of principles and values you believe in, other than good wine and pasta, <laughs> right? But to be an American has nothing to do with ethnicity. It has to do with who we are. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is changing dramatically over the past 40, 50 years. And you can say, well, that's good. Maybe. Some of it, I would argue, is good. Some of it is not. And some of it is foundation. And you mess around with a foundation. And do you know a home? You want someone messing around with your foundation? You want someone taking a hammer at it and start... Bust them out and say, hey, look, the house is going to be better if you get rid of this foundational principle. If you get rid of it, trust me, the house will be more airy. It'll be great. When that house shakes, something comes along. We're, we're messing with foundational principles in America today like we never have before. And we think everything will be okay. It might be. It might be. The foundation may be so strong that we can take these fundamental changes these fundamental assaults on foundations of America. But it would be unlikely for that to happen. And I would make the argument that the reason America is, was, and can be great is because we stuck to those founding principles. And we are getting away from those founding principles. And we are abandoning them for other principles. And I don't believe those principles are as good. And I don't believe they lead to your generation being safer, more prosperous, and good. And we sort of forgot about that. This concept of being good. What does that mean to be good? I know when I was growing up as a kid, when I was growing up as a kid, every time I left my house, you know what my mom said to me? Be good. Be good. Do you think any mom or dad says that to their kids anymore? Be good? Maybe they do. I hope they do. What does that mean anymore? 
be good. See, we used to know. There's a book written, you probably read it, by uh, Robert Putnam uh, called Our Kids. I commend it to you if you haven't read it. I'm sure it's probably required reading around here. But he talks about himself, grow him growing up in the 1950s in uh, Port Clinton, Ohio, and what it's like in Port Clinton, Ohio today. And the value structures that were in place that allowed children to be molded to be good don't exist in America today. They don't. When I went outside as a kid, maybe you, I don't know, you might be the younger than I am, but when I went outside as a kid and I was doing something I shouldn't do, you know what happened to me? My friend's parents would come out and correct me. They would tell me, hey, we don't do that. I'm going to tell your parents. You do that today, you get sued. <laughs> and you wouldn't do it. No parent would ever come out and correct another kid, would they? Would you? How would you feel if some parent in a neighborhood when you were growing up corrected you and told you this kind of behavior isn't acceptable? You would freak out. That was the norm. Why? Because we had to set up standards and values that this is what good behavior was. We don't. We don't. We don't enforce it. You say, that's okay. Individuality. Great. Great. But is America great because we're all doing everything we want to do? Or is it great because... What was the motto of one of the founding mottos of America? The many one. E pluribus unum. I remember I was doing a debate with Howard Dean at Northwestern. And they asked him what the greatest virtue was in America. And he said diversity. I, I, I went like that. Diversity? Diversity is not a virtue. But diver anybody can be diverse. I mean, any society can be diverse. There's no virtue in that. There's no great accomplishment in being diverse. Who cares whether you're diverse or not? It's the great thing about America is you can have diversity and e pluribus unum. Out of many, one. That we can get along. See, the great thing about America is that we figured out a way in which people from diverse backgrounds, diverse ideas, can get along and live a life where we can join together and we can all be free, safe, prosperous. And that just doesn't happen by accident. It happens because there's a rule book what everybody plays by and lives by that allows you to be diverse but understand there's a common set of rules, morality, and principles that we're all going to toe the line and live by. And now what we're saying is we're going to get rid of those threats. We're going to get rid of that morality. We're going to get rid of this truth, and everything is just going to be fine as people go off and do their own things. And my response to that is, good luck with that. That's where you're headed. That's where your generation is. By the way. Your generation, the worst thing your generation can ever do, anybody in your generation, the worst thing you can do is judge someone's action. Oh, that's the, the cardinal sin. You can't say someone did something wrong. How could you do that? I, mean, I, can't, I can't judge them. Right? Don't judge. I'm not going to judge him. But if he punches me, I'm going to judge his action. I'm not saying he's a bad guy if he punches me, but I'm saying what he did was wrong. Okay? And if you don't have the courage to do that anymore, then we're done. You've been told that the worst thing to do is to judge. No, the worst thing to do is not to judge evil. Not to identify evil. Not to identify falsehood. And call it for what it is. That's wrong. That's dangerous. That'll get you in trouble in the long term. So what I would say to that four-year-old Down syndrome girl who's probably now taking a nap is you got a lot on your shoulders. And you've been dealt a hand that's the most complex hand any generation of America has ever been dealt with. And I just hope you understand how big a burden you have that you're dealing with. And by the way, I mean you, because you are the leaders. You're the elites. You say, I'm not an elite. Yeah, you're at Georgetown. You're an elite. Get over it. You're an elite. <laughs> that means you're going to have a lot more to say about the future of this country than any other group of people. <clears throat> and if you go out there and keep getting it wrong, like previous elites that have come out of this place, then America isn't going to be that country that you think it is. And you're not going to be free. You're not going to be safe. You're not going to be prosperous. 
And we're going to be going through a time that you're going to say, what the heck happened? And we're going through a little bit of that right now. Ladies and gentlemen, this race may not be an anomaly. This race may be the norm. Reality TV may come to politics as a normal course. Why? You can't surround yourself with something. Watch it, live it, exhibit it, breathe it, and then expect it not to be there when it matters. And that's where we are. And you, the elites, better get your head around that and understand that truth actually is a good thing. And there is one. We better start believing in it again and living it. Thank you all very much. God bless you.